Welcome to episode 33 of the Horsemanship Breakthroughs podcast, positive reinforcement, block drive lines, the boom, and foal handling with Australian cult starter and clinician, Lucky Luke Thomas. Luke Thomas has worked as a professional horseman since 1987, and for those that's counting, that's longer than I've been alive. He started over 3,000 horses under saddle, and in the last nine years has handled and taught to lead over 2,000 foals and weanlings. Luke is available to assist horse owners via online tuition and also through clinics, classes and his online video series and he's also just released a full masterclass series available on Vimeo. I really enjoyed talking to Luke. I particularly loved the story of how Luke got into positive reinforcement, which is something we don't often see amongst traditional Aussie cowboys. So it's really cool to see someone doing it a little bit different. And to be honest, I have a lot of respect for anyone who's had that much experience with horses. So Luke really knows what's up when it comes to training horses and he's experimented with what sounds like a wide variety of techniques. So he's really got a lot of depth to his knowledge and experience. I know you're going to love this episode, so let's dive in. Welcome to the Horsemanship Breakthroughs podcast, a source for riding and training insights with the goal of helping your horse be a light, happy and willing partner. I'm your host, Amalia Dempsey, a mainstream equestrian rider who discovered natural horsemanship and equine learning theory, and now I help riders like you achieve connection and communication with your horse so you can have more fun and fulfillment whilst prioritizing the partnership. Get more learning resources, including my free connection and communication mini course at AmaliaDempsey.com. Click the follow button so you don't miss an episode. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please leave me a rating and review or screenshot this episode and share on social media. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome Luke Thomas to the Horsemanship Breakthroughs podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me on. It's a great honor. I'm really curious to hear more about your story after doing some minor stalking on social media and Uh all the amazing work that you're doing with foals at the moment. And I have to say that you're also a very funny person. So whenever I need to have a laugh, I just jump on over to your profile and have a little look and my day's a lot better. So thank you for that. Funny in both ways, uh, peculiar and ha-ha. So there you go. (laughs) Well, I'd love to find out a little bit more about your history. So can you tell us about your horsemanship journey today when you got into horses and what has led to where you are today? Okay, so let us begin. Um, Where we started when I was just a kid, there was two horses that mum had in the backyard, in the back paddock behind the house. And we lived, mum was, she was a single mum. However, we lived about three kilometres from the farm, which was her parents' farm, her grandparents' farm, and they had a Hereford stud on the south coast of New South Wales at Milton. And so being a single mum as often as she could, she would you know, send us down the road to our grandparents' place and um, my uncle was running the farm with my grandfather and Uncle had a heifer that he was trying to get into the yards and he bogged the ute and ended up chasing it on foot on, you know, 400 acres and said, right, that's it, I'm getting a horse. And so he bought this horse out of the land newspaper and it came down on the train from Casino up on the north coast and um, it was chestnut quarter horse with big baldy face and four white feet and haunted as you could get you know like just just yeah just a snorty bronc of a thing but uncle bought a saddle and he used to ride around in gumboots and shorts and elbows out you know and um hessian sack as a saddlecloth and when we were we'd go down there on the weekend and the, the real, I think the real deciding factor was what a movie that we watched on the Saturday matinee, you know, we'd sit out on the, in the front deck of the grandparents' house and um, on what, this Saturday, I, I would have been six or seven, there was a, one of those Metro Goldwyn Meyer movies, you know, with the lion roaring, and it was called The Lion and the Horse. 
and it was about a cowboy and a black stallion who he might have caught and tamed, but then it got lost and then it got stolen by a rodeo and and that just was the trigger. So I was mad about horses. It, you know, whatever it was in that film just triggered me and I was just mad about horses from that very early age. We had them in the backyard. Or Pixie and Minnie and and um, anyway, as on our, on my seventh birthday for no, it was Christmas. I was seven, and um, my granddad bought me a pony. Okay, and and I lived on this pony, but you know he was just a rogue. He, you know, he bucked me off, and well, he you know he bucked me off until I cowboyed up as a seven or eight year old and um but time and again you know like i'd go mustering with my uncle uh, you know around the farm mustering cows into the yards and you know um i remember galloping home underneath his neck he'd thrown me off over the saddle over the front of the saddle and i wrapped my arms and legs around his neck and ended up underneath the neck of the horse you know and he's just galloped home wide open gallop and um I lived on that pony, you know. I, I was just, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'd gotten the bug, and as, yeah, he was my world. Um, and then, about nine, when I was about nine, friends of the family went to a, what was not known then, but it was a clinic, and the clinic was run by a fellow called Harry Meyer, and Harry Meyer was one of the biggest horse breakers in Sydney, okay, and he broke in o over his lifetime through his hands and through his stable was 16,000 horses, okay, you know, and at the Inglis yearling sales, which, you know, the famous Inglis yearling sales, the horses would stay in the sale barn and Harry at Randwick, and Harry would break them in at Randwick there, and he, he had up to 30 riders. That's that's how 16,000 horses went through his books, you know. He, he'd have up to 30 riders, and they used to come over the sand hills of La Perouse into Randwick on all these young thoroughbred colts. And um, so when I was nine, Harry was running a, you'd call, today you'd call it a colt starting clinic, Back then it was the breaking in school and I went to that as a nine-year-old. Um, and so then um, just watched, you know, I just watched and I think that he sat me on a horse. Now, Harry was the protege of J.D. Wilton. Okay, and J.D. Wilton was a famous Australian horseman who... Um, wrote a book called The Horse and His Education and he'd started thousands of horses on cattle stations. Um, in the, He started in 1919, J.D. Wilton. He rode from Sydney to Durambandi and I'll just tell you about what he told me on his first job and tells you a little bit about the times that he started his career and so as a young lad starting out he'd ridden from from Sydney to Durambandi which is about 700 mile to start horses and they're incredibly wild right? um, as station horses were then and still are and he had come up with he had to come up with a system and a method of starting these horses, which was different to what he knew because he was, again, from the racing industry and it didn't work. Driving horses in long reins didn't work. They'd kick at the long reins. They were too wild. And so he developed a method of starting horses, which was, I guess, the, the, the main key to it was containing the horse, you know, and... Um, like back in those days, you can imagine that the horses weren't started until they were four, five, six, and seven, because then they could go straight from the breaker into the stock camp 
and they could go and work. And, you know, there was no trucks to truck them out to the where the cattle were, which is how it goes today. They were ridden out to where the cattle were in huge days. And so Jim developed this method of starting horses, which contained them, and there was blindfolds, collar ropes, hobbles, lead ponies, small yards to start them, everything, you know, which was just, it was born out of necessity. Um, and so he developed a, a system which didn't involve driving the horse in, in long reins. It was one rein that he used to mouth the horse. And the interesting thing about the one rein is that um, when he would he'd work on one side of the horse to get suppleness and bend and, and, and movement and have the horse turn to the left and right. And, and I, I sort of, if we called called the group of people that came up with the family, I never, ever heard anyone talk about the horse stepping in underneath and, or disengaging its hind end. However, if you look at what at the system and the method, that was what was occurring. With a, with a yeah, with a bridle and a roller and one rein, the horse would, you know, they um, apply pressure on the rein, the horse would bend his neck to the roller, so lateral flexion. They'd wait and hold in various positions until the horse disengaged his hindquarter and then the release came, okay? And I never heard them ever talk about it. I never, you know, because I came up with this in this family of people who followed this system and this method and had broken in thousands of horses. And um, if we can, yeah, and, and, and apologies to everyone who is offended by the term breaking in, but, you know, I, I, that's what I came up with, you know, the horses were broken. Um, anyway, they they never spoke about the horse disengaging, but looking at it now, I just go, <laughs> look, that hind foot is stepping in underneath that horse. And so Jimmy, will, he, he was a, he was a, a huge um, name back in the day, you know. And then my mentor, Harry Meyer, met Jim Wilton and Harry at the time was starting hundreds of thoroughbred horses in Randwick, okay. Um, all of the big names, Tommy Smith, he did all of Tommy Smith's, all of Neville Beggs, he, you know, he started seven Melbourne Cup winners and 16,000 horses and he, he – adopted Jim Wilton's methods and the funny story I remember because Jim Wilton would would um, lasso the horse and he'd throw a half hitch on its nose. So from a lasso, like a wild horse, that was step one. Like he'd lasso the horse, the wild horse, and then he'd flick his wrist and throw a half hitch, basically putting a halter on the horse from 30 feet away, okay? <laughs> Yeah, and, um, and some people can't even put their halter on properly, right? <laughs> oh, oh, don't talk to me about that. Okay, and and in doing that, he was able, you know, yeah, he could flick his flick his lasso, basically put a wrap around the horse's nose, which would stay there, and and then he could approach it and hold it. Um, but anyway, Harry always talked about when he first he so he employed Jim to come and help him, and uh, he'd have these very expensive yearlings of Tommy Smith and he'd hear them clamouring up the walls and, and he'd think, what on earth is going on? And it was old Jim would be lassoing them and throwing a half hitch on them. So what Harry would do is he'd get one of his sable hands to come lead the horse in a halter and hand the halter and lead rope to Jim so that, you know, that didn't occur. But anyway, so Harry took on Jim Wilton's approach. When I was nine, I went to Harry's horse cold starting clinic and that sort of was start, you know, kind of started my interest in in starting colts and and being a horse breaker because I, you know, I was, um, yeah, just met these amazing people. And then, anyway, um, when I was twelve or so, I got my we bred a horse and. It was started by a fellow from Braidwood who had had a little bit to do with Ray Hunt at the time. And um, anyway, I, I got this horse when I was 12 and, and, again, it was way too much horse for me, same as the pony was way too much horse for me. However, I rose to the occasion, you know, being as just as mad keen about it as I could. 
And um, when I grew up, everyone in my town, I grew up in a town called Milton on the south coast of New South Wales, everyone rode. You know, my neighbour was a farrier, my other neighbour was a racehorse trainer and the farrier's dad was a horse breaker and the farrier's, you know, the farrier broke in horses and and every farmer had a horse, uncle rode around on, on the horse, everyone, all the kids rode, you know, and everybody had a horse, everyone could ride. You know, the pony club was massive. Um, our pony club instructors were amazing and... You know, that was just our world. We were, you know, we got around in flannel. (laughs) Yeah, it was great, you know. And um, anyway, getting back to Harry, Harry came, used to run this school every couple of years. And when I was 14, I went back to Harry's school. So I went there when I was nine and I went back when I was 14. And the way he did, he would mouth the horse the way that he did. You know, with this one rain, side raining, it was called. And um, very interesting. If you ever get the chance to have a look at, at Jim Wilton's video, which he made, it was called The Horse and His Education. Um, it sort of shows you the process. It's compared to nowadays, it's pretty pretty um, old school. <laughs> you know, they use blindfolds, collar ropes and hobbles. It was very old school. Yeah. Um, and, however... At that clinic, Harry would mouth the horse and I did the first rides, all right? So off time went and, and down, you know, down the road a little bit more and um, I home wasn't great. At the time, there was some real problems at home and, and um, I left home with my saddle and my swag at 14 and nine months and I went up to Mudgee and and hooked up with Harry, you know. And at the time he was running a um he wasn't running, he was part of a um a, he and his friend Max Crockett ran a very busy thoroughbred education place on a property called Gunterwang. And and so I started work there with Harry at Gunterwang and Harry would mail all the horses up, Harry and Max would mail them up and there was five or six of us young blokes are riding, you know, and we were there for quite, you know, maybe two or three years with Harry, Harry and Max and, you know, a lot of people would have heard of, heard of Max Crockett and um, at Gundawang and it was, yeah, it was, it was just a Wild West show really, you know, just cowboys and horses and, and yeah, it was fabulous. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of where I went from there. Um, and then I, from from working with Harry and Max, that's just gone on ever since then. As a travelling horseman, you know, like yeah, yeah still yeah. doing it. <laughs> Thirty five years later, so good. You must have so much experience under your belt with that uh, kind of upbringing with horses. And it sounds like now you still do colt starting and a lot of work with foals. Is that correct? Yeah, look, I've just about done with the foals. Um, yep. I'm just about done with it. I did nine years of handling foals on thoroughbred studs. Yep. And like anything, if you do too much of it, it gets old. Mm. And when you have, you know, 300 foals a year, 250, 300 foals a year, you just sort of, it's lovely to start, you miss it. But then sort of, you, you know, three months of, Three months in of walking in a circle, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like you to sort of get through them, it always seems like they always seem like they're wanting you to get them done so they can be branded or get them done so they can be weaned or get them done, you know, and that starts ringing you up. Luke, when are you going to be here? And you're just like, okay, I've still got 40 to get through here. I'll be there. Hang on, what's 40? If I work seven days a week, that'll be, I'll be there in three weeks, okay? Yeah. And so if you do, yeah, I, I, um, I, I'm going back to do some foals. I'm um, just going to do a short stint because I've got, a, a, um, I've got a name drop here. There's a girl called Elsa Sinclair from the States who wants to come and do foals with me. So we're going to do two weeks of foals with Elsa and then I'm handing them over to somebody else. 
Amazing. So, yeah. It's yeah. So good. So I know. Who's teaching who there? I feel like you're. Well, I, that's what I said to Elsa. I said, look, you know, she messaged me and said, can I come and do foals with you? I said, you're going to be sitting in a corner rocking back and forward, just going, <laughs> don't take me home. Because, you know, she's so passive and that's her, you know. Yeah. So um, that's going to be a, um, I'm sure it'll be a mutually beneficial arrangement. And, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. How so, cool. Hmm. One of the things that uh, kind of surprised me when I was doing a little bit of stalking was that you do clicker training. I yeah. don't see many Australian cowboys carrying treats on them. So I'd love to hear about, you know, how you got into positive reinforcement and if you could summarise your kind of training approach and philosophy with horses now. Okay. So my my heart horse, Twisty McWonderful, okay, is um, the horse jumping over the top of me on my book face page. She um, she was a horse that I'd bought to, to sell on, you know, uh, 22 years ago and um, anyway I taught her to lay down the way that I did 22 years ago which was probably holding one leg up and bending the you know head around and you know and um, maybe tapping her on the leg with the stick from there to get the one leg off the ground and then the next and you know how however I had which was not using Positive reinforcement. Um, so anyway, um, I went in to feed her one afternoon, and she was a bit bolshy at the at the table. You know, came in with the ears back, and I went, "No, young lady, you can get over there." And she's, you know, done it again. And I said, "To second that, you can lay down as well, okay?" And so I've. Um, got her to lay down just as, as punishment, you know, 22 years ago. How dare you come at me with your ears back, you little wench. And then I've tipped the full bucket of racehorse, you know, pre-trainer breaker scraps into her feed bin as she's laid down and said, you mind your manners, you little, little wretch. So that afternoon I'm walking along and I've got the wheelbarrow full of feeds, as I did this afternoon, <laughs> walking past. And she didn't get an afternoon feed. She's in a big paddock and she's a good dealer. She got an evening, only, only a morning feed, feed. And I'm just about walked past her paddock and she's run up to the corner, looked at me and laid down. And I've gone, whoa, yeah. okay. <laughs> so I rang my mate and I told him about what had just happened. And this mate of mine, he looks like he's kind of, I don't know, cross between Brad Pitt and, and Tom Cruise. And, you know, he's married, he's hooked up with Sydney's richest girl. Okay. And her dad owns her her dad owns SeaWorld. And, oh, wow. got, and he said, Well, it's a funny thing you should say that, because I, you know, this girlfriend of mine just took me for a behind the scenes tour of the dolphin show at SeaWorld. And what they do is they, they, you know, they'll, they'll throw a fish into the, into the pool with the dolphin and they'll blow a whistle, okay, and they'll keep doing that until the dolphin starts to associate the whistle with the fish. And then they'll put a, a target in the pool with the dolphin. Every time the dolphin swims near the target, they'll blow a whistle and throw the dolphin a fish. And eventually the dolphin will start to touch the target with its nose and they'll blow the whistle and throw it a fish. And then they start to hold, put the target in different places, the floaty, whatever it is, and the dolphin will flop, swim to it, touch it, and they'll blow the whistle and throw it a fish. And they hold the target out of the water and the dolphin will jump out of the water and touch it. And that's how they train the dolphins. And I've gone, well, that's just exactly what's happened with the horse. And so I've tried this. I've you know, and it did not work. I've gone back to the horse and it just didn't work at all because she didn't like fish. But anyway, um, <laughs> anyway, here I am thinking, wow, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm on the cutting edge of horse training here. I've taken this dolphin training and, you know, concept even. I've discovered the same, the same 
technique. And little did I know that, you know, since 1943, B.F. Skinner had been, you know, doing, you know, training all sorts of, you know, that's when it started, 1943. So I was, you know, 50 years too late. But um, that's basically how I got into it. And it's been a part of my repertoire for, you know, yeah, 20 years. And it's due to that horse twisty. Yeah, yeah wow. That's mm. so cool. Yeah. Do you use the positive reinforcement with the foals as well? Um, I don't. And the reason I don't is because the foals are the foals are going into the thoroughbred industry. Yeah. And with all the due respect to the thoroughbred industry, they wouldn't use the, you know, there's no, like there's just so little information in that industry. You know, if you, yeah, it, it, it just wouldn't, they, they'd go, huh, what? <laughs> Why? Yeah so, I, yeah, so I don't think it's quite fair to, I don't feel it's fair to start the fold on food. I certainly scratch them. Mm. You know, and that's that's certainly a big part of it. Yeah. But not not food. Yeah. And they they come around so well with food. You know, they really would. Mm. Um, they come into the yards with food. That's something that we sort of have instigated at the studs. You know, when when I started, they were go you know running them in with the vehicles and. I started, you, you know, luring them into the yard so that every morning when I'd show up, there'd be 20 mares at the gate going, can we come in? And I'd go, in you come, off you go, you know. Yeah, yeah. so um, I'd love to, but as far as that goes, pretty much just scratching is is, is what we would do, and that's basically to build a connection with the fold. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, fair enough. But with your own horses and with lessons, you do incorporate the positive reinforcement if? Yeah, with my own horses and also... Um, at the moment, I'm, I'm studying a few horses and, look, I reach into my pocket and there's a handful of mad cubes right there. So, yeah. Um, as far as a tool goes, well, people say some nice things about me sometimes and about what I do with horses. And generally the things that they see me doing that make them go, oh, wow, that's amazing, that's positive reinforcement. Mm. You know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, it's just such an incredible tool. And I always think about the analogy of somebody trying to change a tyre with a pair of pliers. Mm. And you come along and you say, hey, I've got this thing called a wheel brace. Would you like that? And like, oh, no, nah, mate, that's right. You know? Win winning a horse's confidence like if I get something that comes in now that's just haunted and snorty and you know, really wants to stay away, you know, you can you can win them over so effectively and so efficiently with with food. You know, and they just the thing I love about positive reinforcement is the expression on the horse's face at when when they go, okay, so hang on. So I if I stand stock still and don't move and I hold that pose for three or four seconds, you give me a handful of food. Is that correct? Okay, yes, that's correct. And the look on their face. I always think about Helen Keller when her instructor held her hand under water and spelt the word water on her hand and, and that light bulb moment of, oh, my God, this is communication. So, you know. And the horse that you see it, they reckon with elephants, elephants run around trumpeting mm. when they when they reach that understanding. And you just see it in horses and they, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's an absolutely top tier tool of mine. Um, I it's not I, I've sort of tried for a long time. I ran schools, I um preached it for a long time and people weren't really keen to take it on and I think the re there's two reasons for that firstly it's treats so you don't use treats okay 
you don't use treats. You, uh, you don't use carrots. You don't use apples. You don't use sugar. You don't use licorice. Treats will just make them into an entitled, crowding, mugging brat. Okay? You use, when you offer the horse a food reward, I, I want him to sort of go, well, you know, I had some loosen before and there's some nice grass over there. I'm kind of pretty full, but, yeah, all right. Okay, oh, yeah, 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 sure. You, you know, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. how I want him. I don't want him to go, oh, my God, give me the food, give it, you know. No. Kind of like when you're like, oh, yeah, I reckon I can fit a little bit more in. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's what I. That's how I want my horse. I don't, you know, yeah. I don't want him just going, oh, my God, give it to me because that will, uh, you know, that ruins them. And then people who don't know that go in, they go in with the carrots and the sugar, and next minute the horse is mugging and they're going, well, you know, and then it might nip them if they don't, you know. So the foot is... You know, my first key to using food rewards, step one, get a really big handful of hay, loosen hay, you know, mm. throw it to the horse. Once he's finished that, you know, three biscuits of hay, mm. then go in and start working with food rewards, okay? Yeah. And you what? yeah, that's the thing. And then I think the other thing that is... Maybe to some smaller degree, a bit of a detriment to that type of training. And it's the same with so many different types of horsemanship. I think you could almost call it tribalism. Mm. People are so convinced that their system of working with horses is the only way to go. And anyone else who's doing it different is an animal abuser, you know. And it doesn't matter what type of, you know, who, who you come across, where yeah. you go and find that. And it's, it, I think um, some of the pure positive reinforcement people really need to, you know, we really need to shape them and, you know, say, hey, come on. Yeah. My understanding, what is... You asked, what is my view of horsemanship or what is my... What is your training approach or philosophy with horses? Okay, well, my philosophy is that horsemanship, and it shouldn't be horsemanship because there's only about three of us blokes doing it. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I call mine horse zenship. Yeah, I noticed that. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. My philosophy is that it's a 10,000-piece jigsaw. Mm, totally. You know, it's just... Once you master your your area, your chosen type of following, you know, then you just go to the next jigsaw piece because there's ten thousand others. Yeah. You know, um, and that is I I see that as just a a, a real um, wall in front of so many people. Mm. With their in their journey is they go no I follow this person I follow that system I you know and anything else is is not okay yeah it's and that's not like, okay yeah it's almost like they're zoomed in on that part of the puzzle but if they actually zoom out they can see that there's actually a lot more to that puzzle to explore correct zoom out folks zoom out zoom out I like that. <laughs> Now, moving on, what has been your happiest horsey memory? Hey, look, just recently I went for a ride on my three trick horses. So I've got these three coloured trick horses and um, I've, so I've worked with them. We've performed over a 1,000 shows with them because I, I ran a show at the Australian Stockman's Hall of Fame for four years we ran a show at the um, back of Burke Centre for four years and, you know, I had working dogs and camels and teams of working bullocks and um, Clydesdales and all sorts of things. But we had these trick horses and Twisty is my coloured horse and I fall out of her and, and um, another horse and just, you know, they're basically re retired. We haven't done an awful lot with them since COVID. 
um, and they're pushing 20, if not pulling it. And uh, the other day I just went for a ride on them. And because I'm always riding colts or young horses or problem horses that are problemed with both people's people issues, off I went for this ride on my, my team, you know, and I've got one in each hand and I'm riding one and it was just faultless. And we went, you know, four or five K down the road. And there was no shying. There was no jacking up or worries or anxiety or anything at all. And, um, yeah, so just recently that's that's been something that's really, yeah, I've just gone, wow, that's cool, you know. And I think the fact that because I've known those horses, I've had them since they were pups. Yeah. You know, um, it was, yeah, it was just a fabulous little simple thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes the best moments are those simple moments with our horses. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I'd like to know what has been your biggest horsemanship breakthrough to date, given that the podcast is called Horsemanship Breakthroughs. Okay. All right. So um, there's so many of them. Working with the foals every every few weeks and, and even starting horses every few weeks because I guess I've got an inquiring mind. I just go, wow, how have I? How have I gotten to this stage of my career and not known this? So I think the big, my biggest breakthrough is learning about the horse's eyes. And in particular, there is a line in the eye which is between monocular vision, so one eye, and binocular vision. And the line in the eye is, um, I call it the block drive line. And the block drive line is basically a, the whole eye is an alarm for the horse. You know, we use our eyes to read Facebook and. <laughs> For the horse, the eye is an alarm, mm. okay? And in particular, this the, the line between monocular vision and binocular vision is one of the most triggering areas on the horse. So imagine that there's a horse on the, on the tundra there and... and Back in the day, a saber-toothed tiger is running along, chasing it, okay? So the saber-toothed tiger is just back near the flank and the horse is running really fast to get away from the, the predator. Now, if that predator gets past one eye and gets around the front, the two eyes, then the horse goes, that's it, I'm, you've got me, I'm done, I'm finished. Okay, so there is a rule, a rule amongst horses where a predator shall not pass the line between monocular vision and binocular vision when it's close to me. Because if it does, I am finished. It's got me. What would normally happen is that the horse would be startled by the predator, it would outrun it, after 100 or 200 metres, whatever distance it felt safe at, it would then turn from, its, from seeing the predator in its monocular vision, it would then turn and face that animal and use its binocular vision to go, okay, what was that? When it happens close, when we've got a 12-foot lead on that horse and it's going forward and it's in flight and it's up in its emotions, and then we turn that horse as hind quarter away from us, and it crosses. It ne then looks at us with two eyes with its binocular vision. We can't look at us very well because we're out of focus. The horses don't have the ability to zoom in and zoom out like we do. However, that's what triggers them. And whether so, anything approaching that line triggers them. Anything crossing that line triggers them further. 
And that's been my greatest breakthrough, learning about the block drive line mm -hmm. and how it triggers horses and how to get that block drive line gentle, get that eye gentle so that the horse does not become triggered mm. when something crosses that block drive line. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's the difference between a gentle horse and a not gentle horse. Yeah, that's interesting. It reminds me of um, a horse that I have. He's retired now, but um, when I first got him, he was, you could, people would say he was spooky. You know, anything approaching him fast or slow, especially towards his head, quick reactions, you know. He doesn't mm. show that anymore, and I wonder if um, unknowingly I helped him with that block drive line. Yeah, so what happens is the more that, the more that um, we cross that line, Mm -hmm. the more gentle that becomes, the more um, dulled down that flight response is. Yeah. So it triggers the flight response. Now, one of the reasons is because the what I just explained, sorry, was how if a predator can it cross that line and the horse's flight response is being proved wanting, mm -hmm. so the horse goes, I oh, know you've got me. But the vision between monocular and binocular is so different. Monocular is magnetized, uh, magnified, mm -hmm. okay? Binocular, you've, you've got so much going on. I love learning about the horse's eye. The more I learn about the horse's eye, the, the more I just go, oh, right. The binocular vision is like looking for a pair of binoculars. However, the focus finder, you know, the little yeah, yeah. focus in the middle, that's broken in a horse, okay? The lenses in the horse's eyes don't have the ability to contract and expand like ours do. We can read a text and look 100 metres away and read a sign. The horse's eye doesn't have that ability. And that's, with their binocular vision especially, that's to an advantage to them because the thing is their focus is, is pretty fixed. It takes a long time for it to come in or out. And so they'll be going along and one horse will just say to the other, hey, uh, what's that up there? And the horse, other horse will say, well, I can't really tell because it's blurry. And the first horse will go, well, let's just steer clear of it. And the second horse goes, that's a grand idea. Let's mm. stay well away from that. Okay. And then as they pass that object and it, it goes from binocular into monocular, which is like have, holding a magnifying glass on, you know, to the side there. Mm that object suddenly becomes a lot larger. And the, the monocular vision doesn't have depth perception. So they can't tell how far away that object is. They can with binocular vision looking forward, but not with the monocular. So that's why as you're trotting down the road and there's that rock on the side of the road or the can of whatever it is, the horse is trotting along happily and then suddenly he shoots off to the side away from that object because, number one, it's suddenly become a lot larger. Number two, he, can't, he doesn't have depth perception with his monocular vision, so he can't tell how far away from him it is. So, oh. yeah. The, what's my greatest breakthrough is, F is learning about the eye, mm. learning about, you know, the colours they see, the colours they don't see. They see bright yellow and teal. Mm. Yeah, have you noticed that a lot of horsemanship flags are those colours? Mine especially are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the flags I get, uh, can I drop a name? Kaz's yeah, flags. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I get Kaz's flags as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think her go-to is a bright yellow and teal. Yeah. You know? And when I'm working with foals, the amount of foals and mares that hook onto the flag, I can, I can bring that flag out. And their faces light up and they just go, wow, and you can hold it out to them and have them hook onto the flag and they just follow it around like, what's good, you know, wow, this is incredible. So, you know, and then things like the understanding of how that they're the only two colours they can see and so you know, black and white, everything else is 50 shades of grey. And um, then... But the light, like they're just, they've got 20 
times more rods in their eyes than cones. And so the horse can see so well at night in the dark. Mm. And there goes another deal. You try to get your horse to walk in a puddle. He doesn't see the puddle. He sees the light reflecting off the puddle of the sky. Mm. So it's basically like putting a mirror on the ground for us. Yeah, that would be Not understanding that it's a mirror. (laughs) Yeah, you know, and that's why the horse is going, hey, I'm not stepping in there. You know, it's an abyss. Look how deep it is. It just keeps going. Um, you know, and then you've got your your blind areas. Because that horse's eye is so, um, it's, it's elongated, the pupil, they're basically looking out through almost like a, um, a Ned, I say a Ned Kelly helmet, you know. So there's blind areas above, below, behind, in front. Yeah, well. And, you know, when things suddenly appear in the horse's field of view from these blind areas, he's got, you know, that's, again, triggering for the horse. So the more I, the breakthrough for me over the last few years has been studying, putting to the test, going, okay, that does make sense, you know, or having a question, why is this, studying it. And the more I learn about a horse's vision, the less confusing horses are to me. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to do some more study on that. I yeah. honestly thought you were going to mention the boom for your biggest breakthrough. Well, no, because the boom's been around for years. Tell us about the boom. Okay, so the boom is, um, again, it has to do with the eye and mm-hmm. it has to do with the block drive line. Um, so the boom is a release of nervous energy that the horse feels. No, it doesn't, but Luke feels. <laughs> <laughs> the horse releases its nervous energy. So when, just say I'm sending a foal forward mm-hmm. on, the, on the lead and I turn him to me, his tail moves away, he goes from monocular to binocular across the block drive line and he's raw. Foals are raw. They've had very little, foals are wild horses. Yeah. Had nothing to do with people. And when you cross that block drive line, the foal goes, oh, my God, you've got me. I'm finished. And then it waits a second. It goes, hang on, I survived. So that nervous energy that, that could have propelled that foal hundreds of metres away in a split second, he releases that. And when you are in front of the foal, when he releases the nervous energy, it hits you. The nervousness leaves the foal and it goes into you, and it's a boom. It hits you in the solar plexus, and it can hit you in the throat, top of the head, back of the neck, and it triggers you into your sympathetic nervous system. It triggers you into fright flight. The, that fright and fear leaves the foal goes into you. And this is something that i you know i it's not hippy dippy because people okay. will be thinking that listening to this <laughs> yeah um I, I i worked some horses for a surgeon um recently and um very switched on girl and she's deaf she was standing beside me and i said are you deaf and she didn't respond because she wasn't <laughs> looking at me i went right you're deaf yeah <laughs> okay and she was able to feel this boom Mm. which, you know, quite often takes people a few days, quite a, quite a bit of exposure to the boom to feel it, okay? Um, and she explained how on a cellular level, how the, how the body changes from sympathetic to parasympathetic mm. and how that, that electromagnetic magnetic energy is created. Mm. And so when there's billions of cells changing from how they were to how they are, yeah. You know, and and which is on the what we see is the horse going from fright flight into rest and relax. Um, yeah, she was able to explain it scientifically. So, yeah, I and I can show it to people. I can point the foals. I can spin, the, take the foal away from a mare, 
okay, spin it around just with my hands, take it back to the mayor, but point the foal at someone. The foal will go, oh, I thought you were taking me away from my mum, but it's okay, I'm back. Oh, the foal lets go. That nervous energy goes. And I can point it at people, you know, and I've shown a bunch, shown a bunch of people. It's not, it's not Luke specific. Yeah. Okay. But what it is, it, it hits you and, and triggers all, the, all of the um, symptoms of, of fear in your body, not in your mind. You don't get frightened. In, I don't get frightened in my mind, but I get the butterflies. And what butterflies is, is the blood leaving your digestive system, going to your heart and muscles so you can flee a threat. Mm -hmm. Okay? You can get goosebumps. The hair can stand up on you, you know, all over your body. And until you feel it, you will not feel it. Once you've felt it, you can't not felt it. feel it. It's like if there is traffic going past that you are not listening to mm. until somebody goes, oh, geez, those trucks are loud, and you go, oh, yeah, they are. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we block so much out. We do. And it's only that because of the way that I work with the foals mm -hmm. and sending them forward, Tipping the hind quarter out, bringing the face to me, crossing that block drive line, having the foal come up in his emotions, go, oh, my God, I'm finished, and then go, oh, it's all right, I'm okay. And releasing that nervous energy right in front of me time and again mm. that I started to feel. It. And it's just become the greatest tool because I know when it happens four seconds before the whole foal licks and chews. Okay, and it'll go from the foal to the mare. The first time I saw it was the foal and the mare licking and chewing at the same time, and I went, hang on now, that's not a visual cue. There's something going on here other than that. Yeah, yeah, they're not just mirroring, yeah. Yeah, because it was the time came out an inch, three, you know, four, back in. It was like synchronised yeah, lip licking. Well, that's crazy. And I was like, what's going on here? And then I start to feel about, you know, 500 folds in. And, uh, yeah, and after the thing, what it also does, it triggers your adrenaline. And so by the end of the day, they generally hang on to it for three or four days, three days. On, on the fourth day of handling folds, you know, we're talking about doing 20 at a time, yeah. 25, 30. By the fourth day, they're all letting it go. Yeah. Okay. They're, yeah. they're releasing their nervous energy and it triggers your adrenaline again and again. And by lunch, you're just totally exhausted, you know? Okay. So, yeah. And I've, I've shown it to so many people. I've shown it to vets. I've shown it to um, all sorts of people. Um, Warwick Schiller came and helped us with the foals on the first day we showed him and he was just like, oh, my God, you know? Um, like blown away and yeah, yeah. yeah and the wilder the foal the more nervous energy the bigger the boom mm. yeah yeah and yes it with older horses yes it's exactly the same okay. if an older horse has nervous energy and you trigger him to rise up in his emotion and then drop down absolutely you'll you know you get off wild, off wild horses um off yeah horses when you're doing body work mm -hmm. okay i'll have to keep a look out for it or a feel out for it in a way <laughs> mm. something that happens with me is um i might be giving a lesson demonstrating something and then i'll say oh i'm just gonna pause because the horse is about to yawn and the owner will say like oh they don't they don't usually yawn or you know, how did you know that? And then right on cue, the horse yawns. Yeah. I can't well, explain it, how I know that. <laughs> yeah, well, there it is. And and I guess, too, if if you're not really at the time, if you're not really focusing on that, on what you're feeling. Yeah. Then you won't, you won't hook on, you latch onto it. You won't go, oh, yeah, there it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, yeah. 
Yeah, maybe I've got a glimmer of it there, but I'll I'll yeah. keep looking out for it. <laughs> maybe you've got to be a bit more mindful and aware of what's happening. That's all it takes. That's all it takes because the opposite of that is just unawareness. You know, we don't hear that traffic. We mm. don't hear that radio on. We don't hear the television blaring in the background while we're having a conversation. We block ourselves off to it if we just sort of go, okay, what's there? Yeah. yeah. That's when you feel it. Very cool. Very cool. Mm. And so what are your thoughts on, because, you know, people be listening going, oh, that's a bit hippie or woo-woo for me. What are your thoughts on balancing, like, logical, a behavioural science approach to training and more following feel and intuition and more art-based, I guess, in terms of training horses? Yeah. Horsemanship is a 10,000-piece jigsaw. Yeah, <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. That's... That's probably a good answer for a lot of questions that I have. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and, you know, you are limiting yourself if you just stick to what your belief is. Mm. And, and um, it, there's ego in that, you know. We, yeah. There's tribalism and ego and we're just like, this is, I, I only follow this person because they are the truth or I only follow this system because that is the truth. That worked for me. Hey, there's eight billion of us on the planet. You know, is it? A, so, okay. What is something you wish that every horse owner would do differently? I suppose it goes back to what we just spoke about. <laughs> Zoom out. Yeah, but look, no. <laughs> please learn your groundwork. Yeah. You know, <laughs> um, I I was when I was coming up. When I was starting out, 18, 19, I was out on cattle stations, breaking in horses. I had Ray Hunt's book as my, you know, reference. That was all there was. Yeah. I had Tom Dorrance's, but that was even, you know, more cryptic. Yeah. Um, now, there's so much information out there. Don't, don't limit yourself, you know, like, yeah. and, and the groundwork. Learn your groundwork. Learn clicker training. Learn dressage in hand. Get a, a an instructor who can tell you about your seat. You know, like just take the blinkers off. There's so much information out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's that's gr the groundwork. I traveled. I had to. I was. Um, I traveled with Ray Hunt for four months in the states. It was. The most amazing time of my life. And that guy, I reckon he was the most influential horseman on the planet. Mm. You know, everyone since Ray, like he took the information from Dorrance, he didn't take it, was, you know, associated yeah. with, with Tom Dorrance, and, and Ray took that to the world. And you know, please, you, all you've got to do is find anyone whose last name is horsemanship. Yeah. <laughs> It's the same stuff, you know. It's right there. Pick up your, pick up your iPad or phone. Punch in horsemanship. There'll be five hundred or thousand people saying, "Hey, see this here? Yeah. Learn, you know." And I'd be out of a job if people did that. I would be out of a job, mm. you know. And yeah, it's 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 a corner piece of the jigsaw. There's a ten thousand. It's a 10,000 piece jigsaw. Your groundwork is one of those corner pieces. It's a big that, corner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and if people could do that, if you're equestrians, if you're clicker trainers, if you're, you know, you, you, your competitors yeah. learned how to get their horse to go left, right, forward, and back. Yeah. Up and down on a leaf rope. Yeah. And in a, a lot of people's and especially like English equestrian disciplines in their defence, because I was in that world at one point, um, it's not taught from a young age. Like it's not in Pony Club. It's, I know. Um, it's not. And 
Yeah, and I think people genuinely want to do the right thing by their horses and want to be better on the ground and um, expand their skills, but they're actually not exposed to it. Once I was exposed to it, my eyes just opened and I was like, oh my gosh, there's so much that I don't know. I don't even know anything about horses. Now I've got to start again. (laughs) Yeah. So Yeah, I think um, there's, yeah, it does need to be publicized more and that's what this podcast is all about. So yeah. Can you keep a secret? Go on. <laughs> and all the podcast listeners have got to keep it now as well. <laughs> don't, don't tell anyone, but I was recent over the last couple of years, I was given a, a Frisian warm blood, blood cross horse. And so he's a dressage horse. Mm-hmm. So I bought a dressage saddle. <laughs> <laughs> I actually noticed that it's a bait saddle, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> and the boots. You got the boots. <laughs> So if I can, okay, so I've got this fabulous horse. If I can get the dressage saddle and the boots, and yesterday I had a fabulous dressage lesson, you know. Do you have the white breeches though? I haven't gone that, <laughs> I haven't got to that stage yet. I, You know, I'm still okay. in the rank of the jeans. Yeah. But, you know, if I can go that, if, if I can swing that way, please. Get, you know, you've already, they, people, everyone's got a rope halter and a lead rope in their, in their kit. Yeah. Learn to use it. Yeah, Please, exactly. come on. True, true. <laughs> um, have you seen Anya Barron's work? She's a dressage rider. I've seen a bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah she's one of my pretty... favourite dressage yeah. riders. Yeah, she's just incredible. Her horses are so light and they look happy and it's yeah. just beautiful to watch. Yeah, and, and I, I love it. I, you know, this horse... Um, every time I get a lesson, the instructor goes, that's a serious horse you've got there. And I go, I know. Yeah. And you know, <laughs> I'll be riding along doing my best and I'll go, I think I'm dressaging at the moment, you know. And the horse- <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it's, it's a great, yeah, I love it. It's great to see you. Great, yeah. especially at my age to sort of, you know, some guys get a Harley Davidson or, a hot, you know, a hot new girlfriend or whatever, you know, when they. You I'll get a free <laughs> I like that. Yeah. So if you could have dinner with any three horse people, dead or alive, who would it yeah. be and why? Who would they be? Oh, first of all, the uh, 16-year-old Luke Thomas. Yeah? Yeah. So come here, mate. Listen, <laughs> Listen to me. Tell him? So there's this line between monocular vision and binocular yeah. vision. Okay? And when you cross that line... That's, that's what I'd tell him. And I'd also tell him in 2012, buy Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> Do you ever think, though, I because I think about my journey and I think that everything happened in the perfect sort of sequence for me and I kind of don't regret any of it, even though if I had the knowledge that I have now back then, things probably went smoother. It's almost like I needed to go through that. Yeah, I did, but the horses didn't. Yeah, true. You know? Yeah. So, if I, yeah, like, I, you know, when you're a young bloke and you're out on cattle stations, you've got you're doing you know 15 colts every 10 days. Mm-hmm. You know you need every possible thing you can have in your favour to make things work out into yeah. a win for you, a win for the horse, and a win for the person who's taking that horse on. You know, so I would have loved to have got young Luke and said, "Now listen, buddy, <laughs> this is how you do it." Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got young Luke at the table. Yeah. Now, uh, there was this dude called Genghis Khan. And uh, yeah, you know, he was a bit of an entrepreneur. Um, so I reckon when Genghis Khan and his hordes of horsemen were crossing the Mongolian steppes, how cool would that have been to see? Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah you know, and, and what I would have done, I would have talked to Genghis about reaching down that rein, bending that horse's neck and kicking the hindquarters over because you know how Genghis Khan came to grief, fell off his horse, you know. So, yeah, Genghis Khan would have been a fun chap to have a chat with. And I reckon Geronimo, you know, like that dude was, he'd have been, uh, he was pretty anti-establishment, galloping around on a horse with a string in his mouth. Yeah. So I don't know what we would have had for dinner. It would have been pretty us, <laughs> I think, because he was on the run. He was a hunt, you know, a wanted man. So uh, yeah, those guys would have been would have been pretty good to knock about with. Yeah. What would you have asked them? Well, I'd probably just observed, you know, and yeah, uh, yeah 
just to, I, I always sort of fancy that would be a wonderful a wonderful tourist venture to be able to turn the clock back yeah. however many years and have a look at that life. Yeah. Hmm. And do you have any favourite horse books or resources? Horse books or resources. Look, um, oh, well, Jim Wilton's book is on my shelf. It's there for inspiration. I think I think sometimes if you can if you're just in a bit of a funk, mm-hmm. which will happen if you do too much of anything, you know, if there's a particular something that inspired you initially that you can look at to reignite the fire, then that's good. And, and Jim's book, it was written in the 50s or 60s and, you know, it doesn't apply much now, but it's, it's very inspiring. Mm. Resources, you know, we, it's, it's all there. Yeah. <laughs> it's all there, you know. Like, as I said, when I was, when I was just dying to know because I knew, you know, I was having such, you know, like I used to, I was 20 years old and I was starting horses from February. I, I don't even know how many, but I'd go from February till November across the cattle stations from, you know, the Channel Country in Queensland to across all the way to the Kimberley and back again every year. You know, I just wanted to know how can I get these things better, and uh, the information wasn't there. Now look at us; it's every, you know, yeah, it's horsemanship. You'll be yeah, you'll be there for months looking through all the YouTubes. Yeah, uh, and and again, it's don't limit yourself by going. No, I you know I only do this. Mm. I'm a dressage driver. I'm a, I'm a natural horsemanship person. I'm, I'm purely a clicker trainer. I'm, you know, Honestly, I'm Luke, a, I don't know what I am even anymore. <laughs> well, good. That's great. I don't a box anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, that's fabulous. That's what you're chasing. Yeah. 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 And what is your ultimate goal with horses? Well, a couple of things. With my dressage horse bra, um, I'd love to get Tempe Changes bridles. That'd be fun. Yeah. With clicker training. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've always got the handful of, and with with that horse, like he's he's a haunted bronc. He'll kill you. You know that's why I was given him. He will yeah. kill the average human. Yeah. <laughs> um, and if I do not have something to reward that horse with. Mm-hmm. My experience with him, that 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 ride is so diminished. Mm. Yeah. You know, but if I if he knows that I'm carrying, okay. Wow. As I've got the goods, he he just picks that lead up, you know, and he just mm. yeah, brings those withers up and just I go, oh my god, I'm dressaging. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> It's a nice feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so with, with him, it's, yeah, it's, it's, those, it's, it's those things and definitely with clicker training. And then also if I can, I, I was sort of, I was going out to a job the other week and to, again, once again, I'm driving miles and miles down a bumpy potholed road into the middle of nowhere to take the wild out of somebody's horses and I'm just going, why am I doing this? And why the hell, again, 35 years later, am I still, you know, going out to take the rough off somebody's horses for them? And so, yeah, if I can not have to do that because people know, some, you know, something, if I can share, if I can say, hey, go from binocular, monocular to binocular, mm-hmm. keep that hind quarter out. You know, learn your groundwork. Here, I'll show you. Yeah. You know, if there's any philanthropists out there who can finance me into just travelling, you know, giving this stuff away, you know, um, because that's what needs to happen. People don't go to a clinic because they can't afford it, you know, and maybe the people who can't afford it because they don't have the time or the money, they're the people who need it the most. And so, yeah. I, have, I would like to think that the hundreds of thousands of kilometres I've driven all over Australia, you know, in other places in the world, 
that that's not just been for me to take the wild out of other people's horses. Mm. Hopefully I can show, you know, there's something there that I can, you know, people can share. And, again, it's a shameless piece of promotion. My five-hour foal handling masterclass has gone live on Vimeo tonight. So I wanted to speak about that anyway, so tell us more. Okay, so last two years of, we've had the camera film filming mm-hmm. and I've had the microphone on the last two years while I've been handling the foals and that's, some, you know, probably 600 foals mm-hmm. in the last couple of years. And from that I filmed a 1,000, there was a 1,000 films, wow. over a 1,000, I think it was 1,400, and we've whittled those down and put, um, compressed them into 12 videos and it, the problem, the thing with me, the problem with me is that I flow. I think I'm, you asked, you know, how do you describe your horsemanship? And I think I flow with horses because I've been with them every day since I was seven. I just flow around. How do you do that? Let go. Well, you just flow around them and people can't get that. So it's a huge thing that I've missed in my whole life is structure Mm. though we've structured these so i've had to really think hard and go okay what's the first thing i do and what's the next thing i do and then after that so over over the last couple of years of editing these films i've put them into 12 steps of how i work with those folds Mm -hmm. and yeah it's finally gone live on vimeo tonight and it's for sale on very exciting i know i know i did i did been dancing around all day. I've had this really cool Spotify track in the earphones and the horses are looking at me going, what is wrong with him? <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's good. So people just go to vimeo.com or do they go to your Facebook yeah, page? Yeah, they can go to that. that. Yeah, they can go to Vimeo and look up Foal Handling Masterclass mm-hmm. or they can go to my book face page, which is Luke Thomas Horse Zen Ship. Mm-hmm. And the, yeah, the information's all there. And I'll also put a link to both of those in the show notes for this episode so people can access it easily. Now, before we wrap up, can you tell us what is the one message you would like our listeners to know or hear from today's interview? Horsemanship is a 10,000 piece jigsaw. I reckon that is definitely the theme from today's interview. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast. It's been a great chat. I've personally learned a lot and I'm really curious to check out this full series as well. So thanks again. Awesome. <laughs> oh, wait, thanks. before you go, um, yes. you've got to, it, uh, I hate to put you on the spot, but um, I there are a few of your sayings that I've noticed in some of your posts and I wondered if you could give us some of them before we go. Okay. There's one of my favourites is this old Russian <laughs> proverb that I made up. It's never, ever, ever, under any circumstances, compliment a woman on her moustache. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen mares with moustaches, though? <laughs> yeah, I have. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and you also say lunge long, live long. I like that one. <laughs> yeah, lunge long, live long, you know, and that is something that I do say a lot. And what I mean by that is, before you get on that horse, warm it up, get it animated, you know, and we used to see that on the cattle stations in the late 80s, early 90s. Mm-hmm. There'd be 10 guys head, saddling up horses, heading out to muster cattle for the day. They'd get their barcoo polys, they'd throw them on those horses, they'd girth them up and they'd step on them at 6 in the morning. And it was just like Mount Isa Rodeo. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So warm them up, get them animated. Yeah. And that way you'll survive, you know, lunge long, live long. Warm those horses up, get them moving, get them, you know, yeah. ready mentally, emotionally, physically yeah. to be ridden, you know, yeah. and, and learn how to do that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Lunge, lunge long, live long. Live long. <laughs> Lots of love, Lucky Luke. Love it. All right. On that note, we'll sign off. Thanks, Good on again. You. Thanks so much. 
Thanks for listening to the Horsemanship Breakthroughs podcast. Make sure you hit the follow button so you get notified every time a new episode is released. And if you've learned even just one small thing from today's show, I would really appreciate if you could leave a review on Apple Podcasts or screenshot this episode and share it on social media. You can connect with me on Instagram at Amalia underscore horses or my website, AmaliaDempsey.com, where you can find free resources to help you on your horsemanship journey. That's all for today. Thanks for being here. Remember to train with kindness and ride with excellence, and I'll see you in the next episode. 